Well, good morning, everyone. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Well, thank you all for coming out on this beautiful Northwest morning. Um, you know, I, when we thought about having um, Cherie um, come to give an overview of the allocation model, um, operating budget and allocation overview, I had no idea that there was this amount of interest in it, which is very, very good because I think it's um, important for as many people at the college as we can to understand um, how the operating budget is developed at the state level and how the allocation model is developed and how it impacts on each of our colleges. It's something that you know I've mentioned um, a number of times since I've been here at the college. And so um, I will say that you all know I've been in six different states. Um, and this is probably the most complicated allocation model that I have seen in six different states. And so I continue to learn things about it um, every time I have a conversation with Cherie or we have a conversation um, at the president's meeting about the allocation model. So let's first, let's give Cherie Berthon a round of applause for coming to the And so I will grab my tea and turn it over to Cherie. All right. Good morning. Can people hear me okay? Great. Great. Thanks for. <coughs> I see a hand in the back. Maybe not so much. Yeah. Okay. I, I believe this microphone is on, uh, but we were having to basically hold it this close earlier to test it. So, all right. Can we say it now? Are you able to hear me now? I've heard that we may not have all the mics into the room on but mainly we're trying to make sure that the recording and the folks that are online can hear me okay. And there is somebody monitoring chat. Maybe we could have uh, somebody monitoring chat ask if people, or if listen uh, and let folks who are online <coughs> ask, let us know if they can hear me okay. And I can definitely speak up for people who are in the room. And hopefully I'm not breaking the eardrums of the people that are online. <laughs> Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Cherie Berthon, and I am the Operating Budget Director for the State Board of Community and Technical Colleges. I'm based in Olympia. Uh, I have been in the job for just almost exactly three years, and, and definitely coming in and picking up a new allocation model was quite the task for m m many months at the beginning of my, uh, my time at the State Board. And to me, it's really important that there be as much uh, transparency and clarity of information as possible. As Dr. Harrell said, this allocation model is complicated. And I have, um, after being here a few years, I have a theory about why it's so complicated, which is that we, in our system in Washington, we try to bring everybody into the conversation, which has, it is definitely a good thing. Um, but the allocation model was developed over several years with all of the system uh, business officers and all of the system presidents working to collaboratively to come to some common recommendations with my predecessor and the state board leadership um, about how this model should work. And so what I've observed is that Sometimes things get very complicated because there, there was, that ends up being um, a complicated approach to something that feels as fair as it can feel to the system at the time. Um, so we will kind of start this presentation. Um, oh. I think I'm hitting the advanced arrow. Oh, there we go. Would you hit okay. the arrows there? Yeah. Oh, <coughs> okay, we just did things just take a little while to warm up. <laughs> <laughs> okay. um, so what for, for our time together today, um, I'm an informal presenter. I don't mind having people uh, raise their hands in the middle of the presentation if Dr. Harrell and others are comfortable with that. But I also 
I do want to remain mindful of what we want to cover, and, and I definitely have time built into the uh, end for a longer period of questions and discussion if people would like to. And I believe we have two hours. That is a lot of time, so um, we'll see how we do with that. But first, we'll start with the very highest um, reminder of what are the different roles within the system, and then talk about the state budget as a whole, and then talk about the higher ed and then the community college share. Uh, and do a quick reminder, which all of you I'm sure are very, very familiar with the enrollment trends, but those do um, are, are a big part of our conversation right now and, and how the allocation model is working. Um, then we'll talk about how the state board allocation model works. Um, and I do have a few slides that yeah, have some information that's specific to Tacoma. Um, and yet, we aren't going to dig into um, what I might call the guts of the detail. That's just not conducive to a large group presentation. Um, but I'm always happy to do follow up as Lon uh, and or Dr. Harrell request um, for smaller group conversations where we can get into the guts, if you will. All right, so quick reminder that there that we have, as mentioned before, a complex um, model and we have balancing uh, authorities, I guess, one to another. The state board in the statute, the State Board for Community and Technical College is appointed by the governor. There are labor and business representatives and also representation from the eastern side of the state and the western side of the state. Uh, so there are some specifics that are required of those state board appointments. And there, the statutory uh, uh, duties of the state board, there is very broad uh, authority to oversee and control this system. Um, they are required to submit, prepare and submit a single budget request to the governor and the legislature. Um, but all of that follows a long process in, that takes almost a year, uh, beginning with business officers and all the councils and commissions, then moving to the presidents and then eventually recommendations to the state board on what our budget request will look like. Hopefully <coughs> trying to keep people informed along the way, but I always, I, I never have fully been able to make sure I keep everybody as informed as I'd like, um, but I do try to practice a, please let me know if there's something you're not getting, um, an open door policy as much as possible. Um, so also the state board has the, store, the authority and the, require, the, um, the responsibility to es establish guidelines for the disbursement of state funding, um, both operating and capital, and my counterpart, Wayne Doty, is an amazing wealth of information. He has been managing our capital process and funding for at least eight years, maybe how, may, uh, over 10 years, okay, maybe. Yeah. And he would be a, a ideal speaker as well if you ever want to get into that capital data uh, or capital information. I won't be getting into that today. Um, and then there's a, some general language for the in statute for the state board that they have other powers and duties as necessary to, to govern the community college system. So what does that leave the district board of trustees, right? What is their uh, role? They carry out their mission in response to local needs. Um, they have a sense of local priorities and they adopt a local budget. So we disperse the funds, but the local budget is adopted locally, obviously. Uh, and obviously you're allocating and managing resources here uh, in, the, in the college. And of course you have to follow state law. <laughs> so is, can people see this? Is it large enough? Okay, great. I know there will be some slides that I provided that may be difficult to read but I believe we'll be able to get those out to you electronically so that you can blow them up later. Um, so I, again, I like to start with the, biggest, the, the context of our systems funding comes from the legislature. The legislature budgets on a two-year cycle. So the, we're currently in the 2019-21 budget that was passed by the legislature last session. And the, um, the total amount of funding in that budget was $53 billion. And the biennium before that, it was a $45 billion budget. 
and the biennium before that, it was a $38 billion budget. So the budget has been growing significantly in these last few biennia. A lot of that is due to the McCleary decision, but there are other, more and more of the state budget is being um, dominated by lawsuits and uh, requirements that have come from the courts around uh, multiple responsibilities and whether or not the state is meeting its obligation to citizens. And so we know, uh, everyone knows about the K-12, well, if people are from out of state, I won't assume everyone knows, but there was a, a lawsuit filed in Washington by the McCleary family, and similar lawsuits have been filed around the country that has, that uh, charge that the state was not meeting. It's in, in the Washington state constitution. It says that K-12 funding is a paramount duty. And, and the lawsuit said, you're not meeting your paramount duty to provide adequate and equal public education across the state. That was a fundamental complaint. And after many, many years, um, the, the, the plaintiff prevailed. <laughs> and, and so there have been billions added to K-12. And the most recent session, we'll talk a little bit about the most recent session, we saw for the first time in many years a significant increase in the budget for higher ed, but, but uh, primarily in higher ed, it was financial aid in the community college system that did the best. So uh, just to quickly remind folks, about or, or to let you know if you didn't already know that public schools are about a little more than half of the entire state budget. That's the K-12 system. That has been the case for over 10 years since I've been involved in budgeting. Um, and so even though McCleary uh, brought the number the amount of spending up on public education, the rest of the budget grew as well. So this state uh, K-12 funding has been about half the budget uh, for many, many years. Um, what you can see is that uh, DSHS and other human services make about 22% of the state budget, about 17 billion. Higher education is about 8%, but if we add in the new funding that came in the Workforce Education Investment Act, oh, my slide isn't showing you the very bottom, but that grows to uh, from 4.3 billion up to 4.7 billion. And I usually, hopefully most of my slides won't low like that um, and it, so so the new funding that came in last session related to education uh, the workforce education investment act uh, brought us over 130 million in funding for the system that is um, dedicated just to our community college system and it does but for all of higher ed, that increase takes it from about 4.3 to 4.7 billion. And it's, it was a bit unusual that the bill that provided all that new funding was not included within the budget. It was a separate bill. So that's why you don't see it incorporated here. Uh, special appropriations are about 5%. That's mostly what we call debt service on capital projects. Um, <clears throat> the governor, the courts, and the legislature, and other small, uh, op, uh, agencies within the state government only make up 3%. Natural resources is just 1%. So I try to give you a ballpark of where is the money in the state budget. It's always worth um, having some sense of that. <laughs> Let me try this. Ah, thank you. All right. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> so this is breaking down the, this does include 20, House Bill 2158, the new funding from uh, the Workforce Investment Act. And the total amount of uh, funding for higher ed, as I mentioned before, 4.7 billion, or uh, I have it here in millions. Um, the state board, or the state, the community technical college system gets 38% of that total budget. So we do get the largest share. Uh, financial aid, about 20%. The University of Washington and UW, uh, about 30%. And then the four regional uh, colleges or universities are Evergreen, Central, Eastern, and um, Western. I'm sure you all know that. But those four are uh, in total about 11% of all the higher education budget. Anybody want to ask questions while we're Kind of looking at that. I have a question. 
Uh, the Workforce Investment Act money that was received by the state, were there um, obligations that came with that money? Yes. There were very specific obligations. Um, and in fact, I should have a slide specifically on that, but off the top of my head, I'll give you a ballpark of where the money was. And, and you want to know the obligations to our system specifically, right? Not just. Right. So, I mean, there was, there was, I'm just wondering what was tied to that money. Mm -hmm. And then as it filters down into the colleges, how do we, um, do we have obligations that we have to, um, or outcomes we need to provide that are tied to that money? There, there will definitely be a tracking of outcomes. I know that the presidents are talking continually, as are the institutional research folks, about the best way to approach tracking outcomes. Uh, but the funding that was provided, as you know, there were the very uh, this year we received some funding that we've been calling um, the uh, sort of backfill or the foundational support, where our presidents had. This a very strong message to the legislature. You cannot keep funding our pay raises at 65% of the total cost and assume that locally we have enough resources to cover that 40 or that 35. So that's what the foundational support was from the legislature. Uh, there was also funding for nurse uh, educator salary increases this year, and I'm uh, most folks are familiar with that. Then some. Uh, in this year, a little bit of money for guided pathways planning. Next year, we have an increase of another of 30 million more dollars in guided pathways to really begin to staff up. And this year's planning, next year's beginning to fully implement across the whole system. There's also an additional, we had 20 million for nurse educators. We have another 20 million for high demand faculty. Uh, all of those will be overseen, the long-term outcomes from those funds will be overseen by a board that was created in this, in 2158, and it is still not officially um, appointed, and we don't even have quite the final list of who will be on that board, but there will be legislators, business, higher ed, um, and labor that will be part of this board that will be looking at all of the funding provided under 2158. But I do, I think it's important to be mindful of that, but it's also really important to be mindful that ultimately the legislature will make any decisions about funding in the future under this bill. So even though that board exists and it will be watching and monitoring outcomes from the expenditures and the use of those funds, they by themselves cannot take money away or move it around. They simply can make recommendations to the legislature. Um, so that's, no, I think Question, Will they make their uh, recommendations directly to the legislature or through some other body? Through, directly to the legislature, but probably in an open public process and an open public report. Okay. So that there'd be, we would be at the table. For the regional, Colleges and the research colleges, is there a similar board or agency to the state board that looks at these funds, or is it just aggregated into those pies? Um, it's, it's, uh, the, there, I hear kind of a couple questions in there. There, the board that I mentioned to you that'll have legislators, it will be overseeing uh, all the funding for financial aid, the research, and the uh, 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 regional universities as well. So it won't just be looking at our funding, but but the six public universities are all governed by their own boards of trustees and receive appropriations directly from the legislature. The community college system gets an, a direct a, appropriation directly to the state board that then allocates out. That so that is a very big difference. Um, it's much simpler, uh, except maybe in the world of UW where they're so large. It, it is simpler to get the funding and administer it to your own institution, a single institution where you have direct access to payroll and all, all data. Um, and so, yes, it does introduce levels of complication and bureaucracy in our system that don't exist necessarily in the four-year world. Any other? Okay. So, <clears throat> this is a 
an important conversation in the system over time. I mentioned to you that the presidents have been very vocal to the legislature to, to say um, our tuition and local funds are not growing at a rate that allows us to keep providing a lot of pay increases or cover inflationary costs with these local funds. And there's this ongoing policy conversation both in Washington and across the country that legislatures have a responsibility to, uh, to cover higher education so the burden doesn't fall on students. So this is walking us from 1996 up until today. How much of the funding into our system came from tuition versus state dollars? And so at the, the, the highest point was back in the early 2000s when we had 78% of our operating budget came from the state legislature. That, and then of course only 22% came from tuition. Then we went into recession, and this happened nationally, not just here, and the legislature, to put it quite uh, like one of my friends in higher ed policy, kind of treated higher education like a cash machine and said, we'll increase tuition so that the institutions get more money and we'll cut the state appropriations. And this happened all across the country. Uh, and so they were able to, that, so at the lowest point, um, there was 64% of the system operating budget came from state funds. And so we are gradually um, increasing this, this year, we're at 69% state funds. And next year, if, uh, if everything goes as expected, will be 70% state funds. So it's just a, a real high level policy conversation is, do we think the legislature is doing what it should be doing to keep the burden off of students. <laughs> and it's worth noting too that everything we've talked about so far is at the system level, but our colleges are incredibly different. And so we have colleges that are only 32% of their operating budget is their state allocation. Uh, and they have a lot of contracts and grants and other things happening. We have some small, these tend to be smaller colleges, more rural, 15% of their funding is from grants and contracts, and 65% of their entire campus budget is based on state funds. And this data is a little bit dated. I'm guessing if I did this again for this year, <clears throat> that, that that highest share college would be higher than 65% reliance on state. It would be closer to 68. Um, and then on average, colleges get about 45% of their operating budget from state appropriations, about 18% from grants and contracts, and about 26% from tuition. Any questions? When you say colleges, you just mean the 34? Yes, yes, I just mean our, yes, our system. Running starts considered contract for this. Grant. That's right. So and that's for the per where, <laughs> yes. Big jump is kind of that's now. right. Well, and this doesn't actually show how much Running Start has grown as a share, but yes, Running Start for the purposes of funding within our system, we consider it a contract enrollment because you have a, an agreement with your local school districts to receive the funding. Um, but for the purposes of reporting to the state legislature, which we really don't have to do anymore, but when we did, uh, the state legislature considered Running Start enrollments a state enrollment. But it, it's not considered state enrollment in the allocation model because it's funded separately. So here we are, hopefully the whole slide, yes. Here we are looking a little bit at enrollment for the last 10 years or so, you're, you won't be surprised to see that uh, state FTE enrollments have declined fairly dramatically. This is where you can see the running start increase um, from say around 33,000 back in 2012, 2013, 2014, up to uh, 42,000 FTE at this time that are funded through contract and most of those growth are in Running Start FTE. Uh, and then finally, we have a fairly consistent level of FTE and actually declining, it looks like, in self-support. Um, and so, but the, the, the decline in state-supported enrollments 
and uh, is one of the biggest concerns of our system, as you all know, and I'm sure of your college as well. Sure. I, oh, uh -huh. um, could you um, mention a little bit of what is considered self-support? The best of my ability, I will. <clears throat> a state a state supported uh, program is one in which you do not technically charge tuition. Tuition is a, a fund that's typically reserved uh, legally as a state um, state supported charge. You would charge students the cost of running the program. So the full cost of the program is charged to the students and technically you know, I'm sure we call it tuition for the simplicity of communicating to students, but technically that charge does not have to be equivalent to the tuition rate, and it is considered entirely a self-supporting program. Um, and those have become more common, particularly in the applied baccalaureates. And just to throw out a quick thought is that there is a bit of a political challenge around that, is if the tuition, we've had this in, some colleges where the tuition for applied bachelor that was self-support was higher than the regional university's tuition. Um, and, we're, and so we, we are cognizant that the legislature may look at our system and say, um, why are you doing that? Uh, and why, why is that? And so that, that's just, uh, it's almost more of a political issue than a financial issue, but it is worth keeping in mind. And under statute right now, our applied bachelor's programs the tuition level for state supported programs is not to exceed the uh, regional university's tuition. Thank you. Uh -huh. Any other? Okay, I, I also think this is very interesting and worrisome, I guess. Um, if you wanna look at our FTEs based on the type of course or the, or the, the area of study is maybe a little bit um, what we see is our transfer FTE are quite steady relative to the professional technical FTE declining dramatically um, as well. Basic ed is declining and pre-college is declining. And I think what, what I often have said over the years, even before I came into the community college system, is that in, when the economy is strong, Students without a lot of financial resources cannot afford the opportunity costs of going to college. They have to commit <coughs> to jobs and make continue to hold down the fort and, and survive. Transfer students, especially those that have typically attended the four year, are in a better position to forego the, you know, to not work or to work part time, to have other financial resources um, to support them while they take the time to get a degree. And then they end up much, much better off, as you all know, for the rest of their life. But you have to be able to afford those costs at that time uh, when you're in college to be able to, to um, forego working full And many people do work full time and go to college, as you all know, but, but this is just in general, social trends. Your pre-college course on uh, FTEs, is that the dev ed? I believe so. It, 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 I've always, it's essentially not basic ed, but not college level. Okay. So running starts growing, would that impact that? No, I, I, I was wondering that myself when I first saw it, but this should be excluding, I'll double check, but this should be excluding running start because it, as I understand it, it's the state supported FTE. But um, I, I will double check and make sure that I'm not uh, mistaken on that. <clears throat> so back, one last point about enrollment. It, it, it's a really fundamental piece of the allocation model. Um, is that it, back in, until 2017-19 biennium, the legislature had enrollment targets for each public institution of higher education, well, the four years had their own and we had a system target of 139,000, um, roughly. So the system allocation model has a target based on the legislative target. 
And some of those uh, enrollments are provided very specifically by the legislature for certain programs. So those are what we're calling earmarked state enrollments in this list. For example, aerospace enrollments, aerospace apprenticeships, uh, HEAT is the acronym for the Hospital Employee Education and Training um, enrollments, IBEST enrollments. There are more, certainly more than 120, but 120 is, was recently funded by the legislature and is, is held in a, what we will talk about more as a proviso. And, uh, and then finally, the largest share of earmarked enrollments also held out in the budget are worker retraining enrollments. And so those are all tracked um, in the allocation process on their own. And um, their, your enrollments are tracked and you get a certain share and you have to maintain uh, your share and, yeah. Hi, I'm Rebecca Slager, I teach engineering here. I just kind of wanted to let my, my colleagues know that we have aerospace money as an institution. We have a piece of that. And it's tracked by how students are coded in terms of their degree intent. It is not tracked by the number of um, degrees that we produce. So mm -hmm. as you're talking and working with students, if they are engineering students, it's vitally important that we have them tracked correctly or we are not getting credit for the students that we're actually educating. So just if you're advising students, please make sure. And what you're you're getting at much of this, both the model and the and those earmarked enrollments, really the 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 coding of how how those students are coded and when they come into our system is where the rubber meets the road. And there's certainly room to fix mistakes and but it is worth knowing that most of the data that feeds both all the different allocation processes, will come through IR, institutional research, and your data submission to the state board. Uh, so with 9,055 enrollments in the earmark category, then there are about almost 131,000 in what we consider the base funding. And that all will become more relevant as we go through this conversation, but I wanted you to know there's there are those various categories of enrollments. And when we talk about base funding, what we are talking about is distribution of funding tied to this 130,977 enrollment that as a target. Can you go back real quick? Mm -hmm. What um, are the university contracts? Oh, university contracts, those are at four, I'm glad you, I didn't, didn't mention those. Right now, those are at four colleges. And it is funding that goes directly to universities that have a contract with those four colleges. And I'm sorry, I don't remember which four they are right now. Uh, but essentially, and this is predates me, so I can't give a very thorough explanation, but essentially there's funding that comes into our system specifically because it, we have some programs that are cooperated by uh, public universities. But that funding is is provided to the universities, uh, if I understand it right. So it's almost like a pass through through the system. Uh, yes, uh, yes. But I I stand to be corrected on that because I'm, it's an area I'm not as familiar with. Okay, so getting into how we actually allocate these state dollars that we get, um, just as a uh, I, I want to I should know this right off the top of my head, but in the past years, we've tended to allocate about $750 million a year out to the colleges. This year, we're over $800 million in allocations out to the colleges. And that'll grow again next year uh, to about eight fifty. So what were the key elements that they built into this model? Um, they began, there's been years of talking about a new allocation. There were years of talking about a new allocation model this many many colleges and system presidents were frustrated with the former model it was considered a base plus where you essentially got what you got the year before and if more money came from the legislature you would get your share of that more money based on i believe it was the size of your college um, i don't know if it was the size of your allocation or the size of your enrollments but essentially a pro rata distribution um, of money and it wasn't changing based on enrollment levels among colleges. So the uh, key features that they built into this new model uh, were that were 
enrollment targets for each college would be based on a lag and rolling three-year average actual enrollment. Um, we have encountered some need to smooth out that formula because all districts are, right now are under enrolled and under target. Under enrolled means not meeting their target. Um, and therefore, we had a formula that mathematically would have moved money around regardless of whether there were really FTE at the, for example, we had one, when we realized it, um, Cascadia, as you know, was still over target and they would have gotten the equivalent of uh, almost doubling their allocation in the way that the formula was written. So we did a smoothing of the formula that essentially said, we would only move the number of uh, FTE, which equates to dollars, based on those that are over target and need it, but they wouldn't get more than they actually achieved. And if everyone is under target, no one changes. And that's a big, deal right now in a big conversation I think will be coming in the next few years. 5% um, of the state appropriation is dedicated to performance funding in the Student Achievement Initiative. I think I, I'm not going into a lot of detail into that in that on the Student Achievement Initiative here because it is a complex set of metrics and Darby uh, is a really, Darby Kaikman is the best expert on how those points um, work and, and your IR folks are probably quite familiar with those as well. Um, but the, the policy at the state board level and the president's was 5% of the allocation will be distributed based on SAI uh, points. Then there was a sense that every college needed a minimum amount based on keeping the lights on and the grass watered and mowed. And so there was a decision that each a college would receive 2.85 million in their minimum operating allocation. Um, we'll talk more about that. And there are also priority enrollments, which we'll talk about next as well, or talk about in a minute. As I mentioned before, we have a system where we try to do things as collaboratively as possible. It's very common as the presidents embark on a work group and a a discussion, a new policy that they develop guiding principles. And there, these are, this is a summary of the guiding principles that govern this model, um, that be stable and predictable. As you know, unpredictability and instability in funding is a disaster for institutions. It should be understandable. And I would say that it is complicated. With time, it is understandable. Hopefully today you'll all feel like you understand it a little better. Um, and there, some of these principles you'll see might be mutually, uh, or might be conflicting. So what is, um, what is stable and predictable uh, could do, uh, that's probably not the right example, but uh, there, the uh, right sizing of enrollments, which is the last policy, may not be, um, congruent with doing as little harm as possible. Um, so when the discussion of the model is, is um, happening in the system, these kinds of principles come up, but they don't necessarily, you can't necessarily meet all of the principles all of the time. Um, and obviously allowing as much flexibility locally as possible. The balance of access and enrollment to performance and student outcomes is essentially about uh, performance and providing some funding based on performance, but not too much so that we're hurting colleges' uh, ability to, to uh, get funding based on their enrollment levels. And the right sizing is something that um, has been added in more recent years, but it was a principle all along that this model would better tracked actual enrollments. I would have to say we're, we're really reaching the end of that point at, at, at this time where we're really not tracking to actual enrollments, but we'll talk about why. Uh, so there are funds that are allocated to you that are in the model, 
and the funds that are outside the model. And what we'll talk about first is what's in the model and about 30% of funding is outside the model. But uh, just to give you a ballpark. So back to that minimum operating allocation, um, that 2.85 per college, um, some of that funding comes from the capital budget. So uh, it's a point of confusion for a lot of folks, but a little bit less than 2.85 comes in the operating allocation and, and then a little bit comes in the capital appropriations. Uh, it's a long story, not worth really explaining here why that's split, but um, student, uh, the performance funding, as we mentioned before, 5% of the state appropriation goes into performance metrics, and this year that's 41 million. Uh, priority weighted enrollments, let's talk a little bit about that. And um, what I, I'll mention, I'll go into the numbers later, but it's worth noting just from the very beginning, this has only been about 5% of the funding within the allocation model. And as I came on board, people were constantly asking me about these priority weighted enrollments because they saw that extra weighting of 0.3 as a real value add, which it can be, um, but essentially it isn't making the, you know, the double digit changes in people's allocation. So it, I just think it's important to keep in mind the, sh the share of funding that goes out under priority weighted enrollment so that people don't get an outsized um, perspective on their importance. So the types of enrollments that receive an extra 0.3 of weighting when they are um, uh, when they are appearing in the college's data are adult basic education enrollments, and those obviously oh, I get you in just that those are obviously there because uh, there is no tuition from adult basic ed students, and they're wanted the state board and and I'm assuming the president's also wanted to make sure there was a recognition that these these are still important enrollments for us to maintain and this helps a little bit offset the cost of, of uh, basic ed. You have a question? I have a question about the maximum with STEM. So are you oh, measuring okay. STEM based on the number of students that are sitting in classes with an FTE or on um, degree enhancement? Number of butts and seats. <laughs> it's um, it, there is a actually a SIP code list for uh, the STEM and the skills gap. Uh, your IR people, if they don't know what that SIP code list is, um, I can help them find it. But essentially, it's headcount based on SIP code and course taking behavior. Um, and so STEM courses. So it's your number of students in STEM courses. And then your number of students in upper division um, they, BAS that are state supported. And finally, uh, skills gap. That, and that is uh, one of the most controversial and cumbersome areas of this model is that the system over time has talked about, well, certain programs are higher cost. The system has not been able to agree on how to calculate a higher cost program. And then they have talked about, well, then there are skills gap areas that we want to incentivize. Um, so there have been multiple work groups to look at whether we have adequately or accurately <clears throat> captured where the skills gaps are. The trouble is that uh, colleges in more rural or eastern Washington feel that the skills gap data is biased against them, that it's based more on the urban areas. We had a whole work group around it for about over a year. And what we found is that even using local data still was let, it was even more harmful to rural and uh, Eastern Washington um, districts because they simply just had such small numbers of skills gap in uh, students. Mm -hmm. Whatever the, you know, if it's winemaking, which is what you'll hear from Spokane or Walla Walla, you don't have winemaking on or viticulture on your list of skills gap, but that's a, that's a gap for us. And so we put that on and we looked at those things and they still are disadvantaged. So right now the skills gap is defined based on um, a workforce education coordinating board report that's jointly produced um, by, our, by our research division and the uh, workforce education training board called the Skilled and Educated Workforce and that 
and honestly, it's from 2013. <laughs> so it's, again, doing things by uh, democratic process can sometimes uh, be slower. Um, but we have not had an agreement to, because of some of the impacts on some colleges that do no harm to colleges to move forward with more um, recent uh, iterations of those reports. So, so just telling you like it is. <laughs> um, then the bulk of the funding is in the district enrollment allocation base. And that is, uh, we'll spend a lot more time talking about that as we go on, but it's basically saying if it's not part of these first three categories, it's base funding and we distribute it based on your base target. And actually the stop loss stop gain has now phased out. Uh, this year is, is the, the last year, but what it was was an attempt when the model was first adopted, some colleges, for example, Spokane and Seattle districts lost almost five million in when we switched to the new model. So in order to buffer that, the, the, the loss, um, the gain was balanced out with losses and uh, with a net zero uh, movement of dollars, colleges basically experienced the first year of the new allocation model, 25% of their gain or 25% of their loss. The next year, 50%, last year, 75%, and this year it's 100%, you get what you get in the model. But it was an attempt to smooth the uh, impact on colleges that were losing funding under the new allocation model. And then there's outside the model. Um, we call, I call everything, and I try to keep the presidents in stock, <laughs> in, in, using, I, I try to keep us all on the same page, but sometimes you'll hear different terminology. I call everything outside the model safe harbor. Um, so there are two types essentially of safe harbor. The legislature, when it sets aside money in the budget for a particular purpose, we have some examples there like guided pathways, worker retraining, MESA. Um, there, whenever uh, funding is called out in the budget bill by the legislature, it's a proviso. And we can't put it through the model because the legislature said it's for a very specific purpose and we allocate it uh, that, based on college's ability to, to fulfill that purpose. That's pretty simple. Um, and that is, I would say about 50 million Maybe, maybe a little more than that is in provisos in total. And most of that's worker retraining. Um, then what's outside the model? We have earmarks is the second category. And we really have two buckets of earmarks. By far the largest uh, component of earmarks is something that the presidents themselves asked the system to accommodate. What, it, what they said, when they first were getting ready to implement this model. And one of the main increases from the legislature each year are pay raises, salary increases. And the, pres the president's majority of them believed that if they distributed pay raises based on their past enrollment levels, they could be at risk of not making the payroll. And their basic statement was, I've got to make these pay raises next year, whether I have the enrollments to support them or not. So I don't want to get my pay raises based on my actual enrollments from the past three years. The compromise was a comp talk about complicated um, was that for four years, colleges would receive their raises based on their share of payroll, which is how it was always done in the past. And, but that they, and that, that pay raise would stay in safe Harbor for four years. And then in the fifth year, you would roll that first year into the model. So it's a rolling four years. The very first year of 2016, we had a significant health benefit increase, of almost 25 million in health benefit increase. And that was distributed at the time based on colleges' share of their health benefit costs across the system. This year, that rolled in and was not distributed based on all the other allocation model factors. In the future, it should be more stable at, unless we see another major uh, 
health benefit increase like that. But for the most part, it'll be more stable where um, the four year increase is about the same each year. And when it rolls out of the safe harbor and into the model, then basically you're, each college is still going to get some, but it would depend on is your college's share of the system payroll higher than your share of the system enrollments? Uh, and you can imagine they're correlated, high enrollment, high payroll, but there are some differences. And so those, that, that little bit of a difference is what tells you if you kind of gain or lose. Um, so you might guess some of the colleges, technical colleges tend to have lower payrolls. Um, and so they would do better when money is distributed based on the allocation model than when it's distributed based on their share of payroll. I hope that's not too confusing. And then, so, uh huh. So you said based on the system share of payroll as opposed to the share of enrollment. Actually, I should say target. Enroll of the share of the enrollment target? Yeah. So, which the target won't change for a while. But if the, say, target, yeah. if the target was to change in, in like ours lowered because mm -hmm. our enrollment has been declining, and we have currently a higher share of the system's payroll, which would be out of alignment with what a new target would be. What would that mean? That let's, for example, let's say you had a um, million dollars coming to you for pay raises in fiscal year 2017, which is the 2016-17 school year, and it was held there for you, but then, next year is distributed according to the allocation model formula, you might get, instead of getting that full million, you might get 800,000. You would get some, but you might not get as much as you had before. And it's each calculation is different from year to year, so there's no way to say exactly how you'd be impacted. But when I've looked at it for colleges this year, they've uh, most have, not lost more than a, a few percent or gain more than a few percent, but just as an example, you would, that one million that was sitting there in safe harbor for one year, when it comes out through the model and you measure it on and try to measure it on its own, it's not that easy to isolate, you might see that your gain is only uh, 800,000 when it runs through the model. So you would, um, if there were uh, no other changes and no new money, you would have a little bit less funding. So the college would absorb that difference. Yeah, the locally, the college would have to figure out how to <coughs> cover that, presumably, or cut, or, yeah. Thank you. And the, the same thing that I explained about compensation increases is true for maintenance and operation. So if you have a new capital project, you get to keep the maintenance and operation for four years, and then it rolls into the model. And this is difficult for colleges when they have a brand new building and they maybe get a few hundred thousand dollars and there aren't that many new buildings coming online so you really don't get that like that return like you do on a pay uh, a compensation item but the the flip side of that is that all of the MO that was ever received by colleges when the new model uh, was adopted was lost it was all poured into the model so it it isn't fair if new projects get to keep their funding but everyone built before 2016 lost their m and to just a, an overall uh, allocation method. So that's the, re the rationale. Um, finally, there's state board earmarks and that's when the state board as a policy decides we want this money to be distributed based on a, a specific priority that we have or that we believe the legislature still has, even though the legislature is no longer holding this funding um, out in the budget bill. So some examples, uh, opportunity scholarships, it's not specifically called out in the budget bill as funding that has to be maintained um, uh, at the college level, but it is a high priority of the state board. So it continues to be distributed uh, as that program has been run for many years. Um, centers of Excellence are, an ear, are, are often a state board earmark. They were established and the uh, state board says they should continue to receive the original funding they were given by the legislature to continue to operate. 
Um, and so I, there, each year, the state board has the opportunity to revisit its earmarks, and I, this year they are going to do that. They, they, they want to, not for any particular reason other than good governance, they haven't looked at their earmarks in a while. And so beginning with the, the business officers um, and other commissions and councils are, have also been invited to weigh in, but the presidents will be reviewing all the state board earmarks in early uh, 2020 and making recommendations to the state board about that funding, whether is it the right amount, should it continue at that level? Hi, I'm Monica, I'm the manager for our youth service services office. Uh -huh. So I have some kind of uh, zoomed in questions specifically about the earmarks for disability accommodation. Would now be an appropriate time to share or shall I do after the presentation? Um, I, I <coughs> Maybe one and see if I can get at it, yeah, but I may not be able to do it without going back and looking at files. That's fine. Um, you may have answered a piece of my question slash concern. So it's, it's my understanding, along with um, the Disability Support Services Council, that we really haven't seen meaningful change in our allocations for disability accommodations in many years. Mm -hmm. And yet the landscape of disability education is changing very quickly. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the types of disability experiences and then the cost of accommodation are diff, are not matching. Yeah. There's a huge discrepancy. Yeah. Um, and we've been a little confused as to why that hasn't changed. We've also been a little confused as to exactly what the state board is doing with our staff report, staff report which is disability accommodation report. Mm -hmm. Um, so I, I, I came here hoping maybe that might be focused on a little mm -hmm. bit, but I also understand it's too narrow to the general Well, what I could say is this is a great year to ask those questions through the process, the system processes that are in place. Um, one of the things I know happened a few years ago when this model was being implemented is the business officers looked at the amount of funding dedicated to disability service and said it's so such a small amount, it's kind of token. Why, why, why wouldn't we just put it into the model? And uh, because we don't have a way to calculate or actually specifically pull out, every college has way more requirements and costs than this amount of money. Mm -hmm. Why would we call it out? Well, then there was a strong feeling from a number of stakeholders don't touch that and put it into the model. It's all we've got. It's supporting very specific FTE staff. Um, and so it has been maintained. Others would argue that there are other sources of funding that are, um, you know, is this really making a difference? So that's the back and forth that has happened in the system. I'm confident the business officers on their own are not going to adjust either uh, students of color or students with disability allocation in any negative way um, in their discussion. But, uh, and I don't know, you know, the presidents will talk a bit about all of the earmarks, um, but it's certainly a, a question that has been talked about a lot. May I ask one question? Yeah, sure. What would you recommend be the best way for, um, professionals, psychologists to be involved in this conversation, to share our data. Um, there, I'm not entirely sure that, I, because I'm so focused on the financial piece, I work with business officers. I don't go to the Instruction Commission or Student Services Commission, and so uh, I think Student Services Commission has been a huge advocate to keep this funding as it is, at least, if not grow it. So you may want to talk if this one, this is just my personal opinion, but again, I'm not the most qualified to speak to this, is that you may want to find out who's representing your college on the Student Services Commission and see what, if you can um, enter that conversation and have them make some recommendations up through the channels and 
that's my best advice. You can also um, tell Lon, <laughs> and he can bring it. Um, and uh, and then any other, you know, in this system, um, there's formal and informal channels. So I think that helps. Okay. And then overall, as she said, um, it's supposed to be the review of these earmarks are supposed to be happening with the presidents in the beginning of 2020. So when those types of conversations happen, I always go back to the leadership team for whatever it is we're discussing and ask for data from our own institution that, it, that then equips me to advocate on behalf of whatever we're talking about at, that, at this particular point in time. So when we get to that place, I'll be working through student affairs to get information so I can make sure I'm equipped with the knowledge about how these things are impacting our college and then I'll have that to insert into the conversation. I don't think that there is much convincing to do with the presidents that there is um, more need, particularly in funding, than what we're getting through this particular earmark. I think the conversation will be is how do you balance all of these things because there isn't an unlimited pot of money, so when you increase one area, you have to decrease in another area. So I think that is where the negotiation will have to take place. Mm -hmm. But when that time comes, I'll be sending information to them and they'll be talking to you so I can get as much information as I can. And as she said, it goes through other ways as well. So I believe your um, commission is kind of a subset of the Student Services Commission. So I'm sure throughout their meetings, they should be getting information from you all. So I'm, we're getting it through the Student Services. It will be coming through back and I'll have direct information to bring to the table. Question, um, m and so mm -hmm. our newest building that wasn't done through COP is Health Sciences. Mm -hmm. And Krista, when did it open? 2014. 14. So and this is 19. Mm -hmm. So I think very soon that m and money is going to go into the Model. into the model. Yeah, very well, I don't have the numbers right in front right, of me. Right, and we have to look at very well. And so what that would mean is the money that we had for maintenance and operation goes into the model, which in many ways means that we would be getting less money for that. That's right. So then we have to figure out in our budget, how do we pay for the maintenance and operation that we're getting less money from. Mm -hmm. That's right. That is one that's particularly challenging for campuses because there isn't an equivalency in the model in the model metrics for new buildings. Any other? Sure. What's the total for your marks? The, for the state board. Let's see. I if I have. Make it your next year's slide. Am I? Oh, good. I <laughs> there we go. <laughs> Thank you. Um, there, although this blends them, so this has provisos and earmarks together. If I recall correctly most it it about 50 to 60 million is provisos that means 180 to you know 200 is earmarked so the vast majority of the money money that's outside the allocation model in safe harbor is in that four year compensation increases um, so um, here is the dollar here are the dollars behind um, all of those metrics we just talked about. Um, as you can see, that minimum operating allocation is about 10% of the total state allocation out to the districts. Performance funding is 5% as you, we talked about. Priority enrollments is 5% as well. 4% um, goes to state board operations, their program dollars as well, um, IT services, and then uh, of that 32, about uh, at least 12 is for central services and reserves. So things like the attorney general costs, um, the self-insurance costs for the system, um, those kinds of, and then uh, other statewide services that you wouldn't probably even realize we receive or are paying for, but they do um, come out of the state funding. And then the district enrollment allocation, we could also talk about that as the target, uh, that's about 45% of all the funding and 30% or so is in the earmarks and safe and uh, provisos bucket. 
Um, it's worth, so this was all developed over four years ago and we have changed a lot. The system has changed a lot since it was first developed. Um, the, the target that the system had in the budget is no longer there. And the reason that that was removed is that it, for a lot of years, it was a kind of a meaningless number. The legislature had been funding higher ed as a block grant for many years. They, back in the 90s, um, there was a time where tuition that students paid went straight into the state general fund. It was not kept on campus by the colleges. At the time, the higher ed kind of brokered an agreement with the legislature that it would get to keep its own tuition revenue. Um, then it, that, and that that was about the point where they began to stop funding enrollment so directly. And they gradually loosened and loosened to where at least for the last 15 <coughs> years or more, the legislature has not been increasing funding when enrollment was up or decreasing funding when enrollment was down. Um, and it just essentially been target block, block grants and then uh, pay raises and other increases are built off of um, other, other data, usually. Um, when, in seventh, when the enrollment target was removed, the state board maintained it. They didn't say, well, we're not going to turn our whole allocation process upside down because this number is not in the budget bill. It was never very meaningful anyway. We're maintaining that same number as the system target. Um, there was, an, and so um, it hasn't changed, but it has changed the level at which you know, where that target is set. Performance funding went through uh, its annual or its its uh, five year review. Every five years, performance funding goes under a system wide review, and there were several changes made to the performance funding. And I would that's a whole nother presentation, um, so I won't get into that. But it's worth noting that that began to hit the metrics in 17, 18, and began to hit the funding this year. Um, because it takes a while for the data to come into the model. It has to be, the year has to close, it has to be cleaned, it has to eventually end up in our model. So um, system enrollment trend, every, no one envisioned when this model was created that the enrollment trend would never come back up. Uh, and, and I think everyone is hoping it will, uh, but it's still, just going down. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, our original formula for the target, right sizing the target of each district, was based on the idea that there'll always be some colleges over target and some colleges under target, and we'll move the money around accordingly. As we began to see so few colleges over target, um, we had to smooth it out so that we weren't moving funding unnecessarily. And it just says essentially we'll move the funding if if a college it, it uh, exceeds their target they'll get funded for that in the, and their target will be changed but that no more funding or FTE will be removed from other uh, districts unless they're needed so getting a little bit into your funding um, your minimum operating allocation from the operating, this is again, not necessarily has anything to do with how you receive your funding on campus once it's been put into a budget adopted by your board, but this is what it looks like when it comes out of ours. Um, about uh, about 2.5 million comes to you for minimum operating allocation, and then another 300,000 comes in the capital budget. Um, you have about 7.4 million in provisos and earmarks. So uh, that's about 26% of your funding. Your priority weighted enrollments are right about the system average of 5% of the allocation. Same thing with performance funding, about 5%. And about 55% of your funding is based on your target. Um, and that's 15 million this year. Um, I, I think that, as I mentioned before, the key takeaway from this is that the base is the bulk of your funding and it's based on a target. Um, the, there are certainly enrollments help 
your SAI points, your enrollments help your weighted uh, priority enrollments. Um, and so their enrollment is still very important, but the bulk of your funding is based on a target that is not been changed in the last few years and like and uh, is likely to be maintained until the system um, agrees to change that approach. And I think what's important to see here is that your previous slide, um, when you were looking at the allocation overall, was that the enrollment-based funding was at 45% and we're at 55% at a target that we have not been close to meeting in a very long time. So if the system does decide to change our target and start funding based on our target, we are so off track with the average that other institutions are getting from our, their enrollment target. I mean, we're 10% off track. And as she said, the reason we keep talking about enrollment, 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 because it just doesn't impact the the district enrollment base or your target, as she said, it impacts your performance funding and your priority weighted MTE. So it impacts the majority of the funding that we receive. Uh, um, Rebecca? I was just wondering, you showed earlier that um, transfer enrollment was fairly stable. We were seeing drops in other areas. Are we seeing the same thing on our campus or does our campus trend? No, our campus trend looks um, looks a little different. It when we looked kind of overall, it's like everything is dropping. Yeah, just not um, prop tech. Um, the only thing that is at this particular point in time that's increasing at the college, well, as we sit here now, are BAS degrees. Prior to that, it was running start, and we've had a slight dip in running start for this year. But if you look at kind of over the past five years, the things that have been increasing are BAS and running start. Everything else has been declining. Okay, so my question has to do with the priority weighted MTE. And how do we know? Um, you mentioned that for the skills gap, there's this old report that you can kind of find out what, what programs would fall within that. Um, with regards to STEM, how would we find out um, the most recent ones? So, what would be considered STEM? Because I want to know what are, what are the priority weighted MTE groups that are here? Right, we right. So we, we, we have the SIP codes. And mm -hmm. What we can do is um, get them from enrollment services and make sure that we send those who, who would like to have them. Um, because one of the things that um, Amber and Patrick and the team are working on is going through all of the coding to make sure that folks are, students are in the right places, et cetera, because it does have a direct impact on varying types of enrollment, as you see. And we've got a lot of cleanup to do with that. Right, who knew that IR folks would be the money bags? <laughs> they really. Um, so, any other questions on these? Okay. So, one of the, I, I really struggled with these next couple of slides on what's the right way to talk about target and funding with a large group. Um, typically, with a small group, I would break out the actual calculations but so what i've done here is try to walk through the steps in the last few years of what's happened to each district's um target and not try to show exactly how the uh, number was arrived at but just show the change in the target from year to year um, and as you look at the whole list can i'm not sure if you can even read these numbers but again later you'll have them Yes. So what what we have is one thing it's worth noting that Bates is always the special case. Um, and <laughs> Bates, at the time when this model was first uh, adopted, had a target of 40,252. But it was determined uh, through a process I wasn't involved in, it was prior to my time, that really their enrollments were much, much lower than that. And they went on, and, and that taking them into the new model would have essentially ruined their, uh, well, actually, Patrick, you <laughs> you may know. Oh, they they had about more. 1,600 FTE that were 
probably should not have been state considered state supported and there were concerns with how they were calculated. So if they were six, I mean, yeah. Yeah. So where every other district, their target was calculated or recalculated based on historic enrollment data, Bates was given a, what we called a, a glide path is what everybody calls it. <laughs> um, but essentially they uh, took 231 FTE away from them each year for four years. And then the idea was they would uh, kind of bring up their enrollments and we would, they would have a planned level of reduction. Um, so even when, what we'll see is that in more recent years, they've been the only reduction. Um, but essentially the first year into the model, Tacoma's target increased by 467 FTE, it grew to 4,800, 4,801. And then uh, the target came in with this target in 1718. And because of your enrollments, you grew by 500 up to 5304. And what you can see is that many other colleges were having to, were losing FTE and losing um, uh, funding and their targets were declining. Um, and we kind of knew going in Bellevue had uh, a lot of growth to catch up on in its target, Cascadia as well. Um, uh, considering its size, that's a large increase. This, yeah. this and, sorry. Uh -huh. This based on the deed, the total, yeah. or the deed, yeah. the base total? It's the, it's called, I call it target because people, but it's also can be called the district enrollment allocation okay. base or deed. Okay. But that acronym, I'm trying to get to Jan Yoshiwara, our director, is reason uh, very um, kindly said stop using so many <coughs> acronyms. So it's essentially the, the target is the same as what you might hear is called the deed or the district enrollment allocation base. Um, and so the the, the, actually, I think you had the largest increase in the 17 to 18, up to 5,300 for your new target going in uh, to the 17 18 year. Um, what we saw in 18 19 is that everybody, it just took two years to basically meet targets to actual three year average enrollments. And then if you see a zero, it's likely that that college is at or under target. Um, so in 1819, Bates was still on its glide path of losing 231, and it essentially provided all the FTE for the few colleges that were over enrolled. So it, whoops, oh sorry, I thought I was hitting my pointer. Um, the, um, so this 231 was taken from Bates, um, a couple lost one here and there, but essentially the distribution went to those colleges that were still over target. Um, but Bellevue, for example, by 1819, they were no longer over target. They didn't, they did not exceed their target. Um, people were surprised. They thought, oh, it must be Bellingham, or it must be Bellevue, not Bellingham, but Bellingham was over target. Then uh, Cascadia, Everett, and Pierce. Everyone else was at or below target. Um, then coming into the current year, really um, one high line was just slightly over target. And due to rounding, uh, we didn't quite take away exactly 10, uh, but, but we essentially adjusted down. Those that were the most under enrolled or most under target lost one or two FTE. So, um, yeah, so they're, the, right, they're just, so this is just reflecting the allocation model kind of accomplished what it was supposed to accomplish about in 1819. And then this year, this is a slightly more alarming slide uh, than it needs to be, but it's the simplest way to explain it. Um, what we have, is rather your three-year average enrollment is what you compare to your target. Um, but in order to make a clear point in time, because there's lags and there's complexity, this is where you were in 1819. Your target was 5,300. 
your actual enrollments were 42 or 4,300, so about 1,000 under, um, which is about 24% below target in just one year. Now, if you look at your three-year average compared to your target, it's better, and you're about 10% under, as Dr. Harrell said. But I use this because it's a little easier to think about one-year enrollment versus three years of enrollment, and it points at both the, the very dramatic amount of red. Uh, High Line happened in, uh, excuse me, Green River, Green River. Uh, everybody gave Green River a big round of applause for this <laughs> six FDE, but in that year they did um, exceed their target slightly. Um, and everyone else was under by double, most under by double digits. Um, and so you can see you are not the most under target that year, but you are one of the more under target. Um, looks like we've got Peninsula is the furthest under, and Clark is in pretty, uh, and Clark is a larger college. Um, and so uh, they are also, and Big Bend, and um, they are still struggling. Oh, and this one, yeah, Clark's. Um, so, what this slide is essentially pointing at, um, everyone is, un almost everyone is under target. However, some are a lot more under target than others, and some of the colleges that are a couple, you know, a few percent under are saying, well, why do I get the equal level of funding to somebody that's 20 or 30 percent under target? And so, you can imagine that the, tar the model's been in place now uh, for about four years, and the presidents this year are talking about when and how to review the model. And that hasn't been decided yet. It's, it, and the, the how is to me is more important than the when, um, because I, personally, I don't wanna see us reopen everything and renegotiate every aspect of the model because it would take years. Um, but if, if they reopen discussion of how the model is working, this is likely to be the focal point because it's the most money and it's the furthest from what was sort of envisioned. Um, and so I, again, I bring it up as just the, the, the serious risks that some colleges are under if, and again, the, the metrics, or sorry, the principles that they use try to, um, reduce harm. <laughs> so undoubtedly um, that, that part of our principles and values will be a big part of the conversation. Um, some of the colleges that are the most under enrolled are also the smallest. Peninsula I think is um, just slightly larger than Grace Harbor but one of the smallest colleges in the system. Um, and so uh, would you know, an adjustment, a, a drastic adjustment uh, potentially put some colleges out of business. I don't know. Um, so I think that that is the most uh, the most important point to keep in mind is keeping as much stability as we can, but also really looking at the model principles. And I and before think you, that's it. Before oh, you yeah. go on to that one, um, oh, okay, a, couple, my name, a couple other things to think about is Everything that we've been discussing, if you look at this particular slide, is um, our district, our DEAB, or target, or whatever you want to call it, B. Remember, this does also not talk about tuition and fee revenue. Mm -hmm. So as enrollment is declining, think about we get less, we get fewer and fewer revenues from tuition and fees. Part of the discussion that, that she mentioned um, at the president's level is there are some presidents who are extremely vocal as to why we are not making some changes now. If we just look at Pierce um, in Tacoma, our target is not that much different by 60 something. Whereas if you look at our actual um, enrollments, uh, Pierce's are over what, 800, 800 or something, more than we are. But we're not we're getting the our amount of funding has not decreased thus far so if you look at that we are actually getting more money per fte of actual fte than pierce is getting and i'm just using that as an example because the target is fairly close 
And so if, because these conversations will be opening up, and if there is some, if there are some thoughts about adjusting this, we're so far off our target, we will be one of the colleges that will be hit the hardest. And yes, those are the principles there about smoothing things out. I would hope that if that was the case, we would be on a gliding scale like Bates was, and so it's not all <laughs> taken away at the same time. But what we also don't want to do is be in a position that if this were to take place, we would be in a world of trouble, which is why we are going to go and have those hard conversations this year about how do we decrease our expenses? Because we're 24% off of the target as we sit here today. Yes, sorry to be the bearer of bad numbers, um, but well, it's, it doesn't realistic yeah. numbers. Yeah. yeah, you're not. You're just the bearer yeah. of numbers. Yes, you're the bearer of <laughs> of the, the um, data. But that that is all that all the information I I have for you today. If I'm happy to answer more questions or Other, or others. More questions. I just want to do a quick clarification, just so folks know the numbers that I put out are the total state funded FTE. So they are gonna be slightly different than what you're seeing up here because this is a district enrollment allocation base. Mm -hmm. Mine has the provisos and the earmarks that are right. included. So That's it's right. a slightly higher number for what the allocation is and where we're at. So if you are getting into them deep and you look at that and go, hold on, that doesn't match some of the stuff that we've sent out, that is why, because ours includes yeah. a little bit more information. That's right. That's and the other thing to think about is when you're reading um, Patrick's updates, there um, for a point, another point of clarification is the enrollment target that we have for developing our budget is not the same if you we, we go back. Um, is not the same as the 5304. Because there's no way we should build our, particularly our um, projections for tuition and fee on the 5304. So we have budgeted for a decline and we are right about even to what we have um, projected from a budgetary standpoint to, for this year, which is very different from us even getting close to achieving the enrollment that we're being paid for from the state perspective. Questions, Rebecca. I always have questions. Um, so you you mentioned that perhaps some of the small schools are struggling the most. Um, obviously, we struggled a lot with our CTC link um, mm -hmm. management and, and the enrollments. I think that cost us a good major. But as you guys were looking at these variations, did you see any trends that might be interesting to us as to why some colleges would be struggling more than others, and maybe ideas that we could use to help? You know, I, not that I've seen, in fact, one of the, uh, the assertions earlier this year was, so we've done some analysis of whether you can, over history, explain enrollment declines and increases based on uh, geography or uh, urban rural, and we have not been able to see it. The reason that we did it is that one, there was an assertion that, well, when enrollment starts to pick up, there, those enrollments will go to the urban colleges, and then if we reach our system target, uh, those colleges that reach their target later uh, will be more ur or rural, and they will uh, not be able to get more FTE because we'll reach the system target. Um, that assertion, the, the mechanics uh, in the way the formula works right now would be true that we have a system target and when we're there, if you're meeting your target, you keep where you're, you keep your level. Um, that might also be part of what gets discussed in the future. Is it, is it worth having a system target anymore? Uh, however, we could not see any, we looked at the last three recessions and the enrollment patterns and we could not see any pattern of urban versus rural, small versus large. Um, in fact, there were, and I, we were looking more at the recovery patterns. Um, 
So we could go back and look more on the declining side, but we just couldn't explain it with any you know, any uh, particular, I would suspect folks who really know their local regions might know better. Like I've, for example, Clark has had massive enrollment declines and um, a few things I'm aware of, I'm not sure if this is the way they would explain it, but not too long ago, Oregon passed a policy that provided uh, financial aid for all uh, and the sense was, were there Oregon students in Washington who then were able to stay in Oregon? Second is, I know that WSU Vancouver, located very close to Clark College, has been recruiting like crazy. I know all of the four years have been recruiting, and there's a general sense that the four-year uh, uh, institutions are gobbling up everyone they can get. Um, and that may explain, it. so I, I think there each community may have slightly different reasons and maybe even from one recession to the next that would explain it. And, I'll, um, and I'll also say um, we have a lot of cleanup and fixing to do at this college um, that has had and continues to have a direct impact on enrollment. Um, what I'm about to say will be an overgeneralized statement, but I remember my first day here at the college sitting and saying, enrollment has been declining. What is our plan? What have we been doing? And I'm not saying that there aren't, there weren't things that were happening in certain parts of the college, but overall there was no, there was no plan. And I think part of it was the college had been for so many years over enrolled and um, we didn't have to do much recruitment. We were flush in cash and so um, holding folk accountable to, to staying within their own budgets, those are things that just weren't happening at the level that needs to happen. Coding, we know we have had issues with coding. I mean, there are all these things that need attention and we're putting attention on them but it will take time to fix. So there are a lot of, and so we can talk about all of the external landscape and the impact on college enrollment, but we have significant issues internally that need to be fixed. And we've got to get to a place where everyone understands that enrollment is the job of every single person at the college. It is not just the job of student affairs, it's not, of the marketing team, the enrollment team, it is the job of every single one of us. And until we get to a place where we all know that, understand it, and understand the role that we play in this, and we're being intentional to fixing those things and also being open to the fact that we've got to do things differently. And so when you hear, start to hear pushback on needing to change things in a way that, is, that will hopefully get us to a place where enrollment's declining, and it's just like, well, do we sit and do the exact same thing and expect that 24% number to get better? The other thing I continue to say is, and I've said it, and I said it to the leadership team um, on the first day is, we will not use the excuse of the economy being good. Because there are thousands, the report I think is 12 to 15,000 people in Pierce County 18 to 24 years old who have no high school diploma and or post-secondary education. We shouldn't have any kind of enrollment problem. But everything that we're doing and planning to do with the strategic plan, all of the great work with Guided Pathways, the Enrollment Management Committee, when it will take time for those things to gel together, but I do think all of those plans are going to get us to a place where we're going to start to see enrollment increases. It takes a, long, a longer time than we really want to change that ship, which is why in the meantime, we've got to have those harder conversations about how do we decrease our expenses so we don't get to a point where um, we've got to make some extremely critical decisions and make some extremely critical reductions in a very, very short period of time. Bob. Uh, I had a question. Uh, are the four-year institutions experiencing a similar decline in enrollment? Most of them know there are, Evergreen is behaving more like a community college and it's enrollment and it has other challenges uh, that on an enrollment level, but um, for the most part, um, 
they, I would say UW and WSU, no, they have been flat or growing Western as well. Um, and then there's um, Central and Eastern have, I think had to work harder to stay flat. Um, but I know that Western WSU and UW are essentially growing if they want to. And um, the Central and Eastern are staying fairly flat. I think all higher ed and even K-12 is worried about the demographics that the number of uh, high school age students is not growing. Um, and so that is uh, a conversation to be had. But, um, but again, I think that's why that explains some of our enrollment issues if the four years are in, in letting in more students to maintain uh, their enrollment levels. Uh, there are fewer to come to us. Have you seen any projections on, um, because I've been seeing some things that they're talking about incoming, when the economy slows down, most people are not projecting that college enrollments are going to be increasing. That's a great question. I think this is, you know, you all have as much to, that it, it isn't, um, not everyone thinks it's a given that our enrollments will come back if the economy declines again. But I'll leave that to greater minds. Other questions? Christopher, are you monitoring online? Any <coughs> questions from online? No. I'm okay. Fine. Questions? This is your chance. The best chance. With the expert. Julie. Um, what was the college affordability program? Back, back in 2015, uh, when the Senate was still led by Republicans, they passed a bill called the College Affordability Plan that decreased tuition. Uh, you might remember, it, it decreased tuition over a two-year period. Ours went down by 5% and then stayed down, frozen at 5% in the second year. Um, and then the four-year universities, which is a bigger target, they weren't going to touch our, um, to, let's see, I, yeah, I, yeah, they weren't going to touch our tuition originally under that bill. Um, they were targeting mainly the four-year sector, but uh, I think that there was a sense that our students deserved a, a tuition cut too. The students were really vocal about that. Um, however, the UW went down by 20%, so did WSU, and then the regionals went down, I think by a total of 10 or 15, it's been a few years, but each of the um, universities and colleges, their tuition was decreased, and then the state offered some backfill for that lost funding, and said that because you're losing this tuition revenue, and it's forever out of your base, we're going to continue to provide you that funding and provide inflation on that funding. So that's what that is for. It was distributed, it was set at a point in time back based on um, enrollments when the tuition was reduced and they tried to tr distribute that funding as closely as possible to the level of funding you lost by your tuition going down 5%. Um, but because it was based on a single point in time, um, there, they, we don't re-rack how that funding is distributed. You still get basically the same percentage, but a little bit more each year. And I wondered if at some point the legislator, legislature might look at that and say, hey, you're, all those tuition payers are now gone. Why would we still be giving you that? But they, for, the, in, for now they are, and it, it is going to the four years and us. A um, couple other questions for you. One is, it was in sixteen seventeen that um, it changed that we can only put 2% of international. Yes. So I think about that was another thing is we were one of the colleges that prior to mm -hmm. the change in international. So our overall target is 5304. <coughs> so we can take 2% of that, which is about 110 FTE, from our international population and move it in to help count us hitting our enrollment target. Prior to that time, we were one of the colleges that put all of our international enrollment 
into our state funded, which is why, which is part of the reason we had those big spikes. Um, part of it um, showed that we were the most over-enrolled college at the time, which had some significant benefits for us, particularly from a capital perspective. But that is also part of the reason why when you make the change, our, in, our actual enrollment, um, you see a decline there because we could only then now use 2% and not all of our international enrollment. So that's one change that we've um, talked about a number of times. Okay, yeah, 102 for us. Oh, so we had 476 FTE in our state funded from international and so it's now down to like 102. Um, so that's when you'll see some of that decrease as well, but it doesn't account for thousands of decrease in FTE. The question I have is, do we have the ability to run the model ourselves to predict how it may change based on certain things? Yes. And do we already have access to that? <laughs> we, um, the, the model goes out, uh, the one that is the basis for the first allocation goes out um, and not everyone feels it's comfortable playing with it, uh -huh. <laughs> but you can and I can help you play with it okay. as well. Yeah, I think that would be very, very helpful. No, it's a little bit of a loaded question, but it's one I get often. What is the value of an FTE? It's a great question and it's something that I, I didn't put in writing in the slides and I don't really have, I haven't really covered it. It, there is most aspects of the model except that minimum operating allocation are relative, meaning and relational. So what happens is we get the state funding, we take out that funding that is required to go for particular purposes. So that's the safe harbor items and the rest goes through the model. Um, based on the criteria we've talked about, it it does not, it is, the, the value of an FTE is something you can calculate retroactively, but it does not, it is not an initial calculation. So if we get more money uh, and we have fewer enrollments, then the value of an FTE is higher. That doesn't mean you, it's, it, and so that is the, there is there are some states and, and as Dr. Harrell was mentioning earlier that have a much simpler funding method, which would be um, perhaps the whole all the public institutions of higher ed are on the same computer system and data system, and the central state office would look at your fall enrollment uh, and or maybe look at last year's and create a dollar value and fund you based on that. Um, and the, that might be the way the bulk of your funding is provided and the dollar value may be set prior to any other calculations. Some states operate like that. We don't, partly because the legislature doesn't operate like that. Um, and so it's the same thing, it's just to make things more complicated, but it's worth knowing, I was mentioning earlier, it's worth knowing what you can know. Part of the challenge with predicting your your future years of uh, funding through this allocation model is that, for example, with student achievement initiative points, we take the 5%, we, um, we, we know that's about 40 million this year, and you get funded based on your share of the student achievement points. So if next year you increase your student achievement points by 5%, but every other college somehow increases theirs by 10%, you won't get more money out of that 5% allocation. And it is, um, I haven't figured out a better, I mean, I'm not, we're not reopening <coughs> these major issues, but it is a real challenge for projecting and it, it does make it difficult because things are relative. And um, that's, that's the, I'm glad you asked because it's worth putting it out there that it isn't a quick, I, I get the question all the time too, what's the value of an FTE, especially from people who come from states where there is a value, but we just back into it. Um, and we can tell you based on our target of 130,978, and if I take, if there's, uh, what do we say, 450 million or something, say 500 million. So I 
I calculate an FTE value, but uh, that doesn't take into account the, any other funding you received in other categories. And so again, it's, it's more of a retroactive calculation. But they do matter. <laughs> you certainly, your actual enrollments really do matter. Any last questions? One once, twice, sold. All right, let's give Cherie a wonderful round of applause. Thank you for coming and spending some time with us. You know, it is complicated, but I think we all understand a little bit more today. So thank you. We'll make sure we send out the presentation. Um, <coughs> We'll make sure we send out the presentation so that everyone has it. And make sure you're sharing it with other folks Everybody. who couldn't be here today. All right? Thank you all. And please make sure you sign in. Thank you so much.